Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Mark Joseph. Uh, I'm uh, the State Risk Underwriting Manager with the Office of Risk Management. Uh, we're here today to talk about insurance and indemnification language and contracts. Um, for some of you, this isn't the first time hearing this presentation. I assure you that I will try my best to, to provide some, some new and, and valuable information as we go through this. Uh, we have about an hour today, so I'm going to be talking fast, but uh, by all means, if you have questions as we're going, please put them in the chat, and uh, we'll try to get to them as they come in. Um, and, and hopefully, if there's questions at the end, we'll have a little time for that as well. Um, so just to kind of get started here, we publish or put out uh, a contract manual on our website. The link is right there on this slide. Uh, it is a long, ridiculous uh, web address now, so if you if you can't find it, feel free to, to reach out to me and I can send you the link uh, if you're looking for it after this presentation. So what is the purpose of our manual? It's uh, an explanation of the need for proper insurance. It's really designed to, to be a tool for our agencies that are, that are going into contracts, not just from a contract drafting standpoint, but also for those, uh, those contracts that they're entering into with third par parties that are outside of necessarily procurement. Those could be, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we're going through this. But our ultimate goal is to help limit the organization's liability by using appropriate contract wording. So this is the, the legal slide, right? This is to, to let you know that I am not a lawyer. Uh, you should not take what I say as legal advice. I'm looking at this purely from the risk management perspective. Um, anything, any, anything that that we recommend by all means run it by your legal counsel if, if uh, there's questions or concerns about that. But our guy, our, our manual and our wording is a recommendation. Um, we depend on the agencies to, to enforce those recommendations. And, uh, and if there's questions about why we recommend that wording, we always encourage that and you're always free to reach out to myself. Uh, some of you may know Christy Bro in our agency or uh, Melissa Harris before, before me. She was one of the the contract points of contact down there at ORM before. Um, but when we're looking through these, these various recommendations, there are special circumstances that come up and uh, there may not be a, a quick fix that's, that's in that, that manual. So it's, it's good to reach out and ask questions. So kind of getting into the introductory stages of what we're talking about here, you know, when we start looking at what appropriate language would look like from an insurance and risk management standpoint. We really need to know what we're dealing with. So we need to know what type of contract we have. Um, you know, lots of times when I, when I get a question from OSP, I know that it's coming from the state is drafting that contract. It's our contract that we're putting out to them. Uh, but there are instances where we're looking at a contract that was drafted by a third party that we have to, to be aware of. There's times where exceptions are made and they try to send back wording that is, is the contractor's language. And those are some of the things that we want to know. What type of agreement are we entering into? Uh, is it uh, an RFP where it's a very formal process? Are we looking at a, a third party lease agreement uh, where we're leasing office space? Is it a cooperative endeavor agreement where there are other considerations outside of, of our normal uh, money for services type of, of agenda, or is it something a little less formal, like a memorandum of understanding? Um, in all of these different scenarios, it's still important to consider the, the insurance aspects and the exposures that we have when we enter into those agreements. So no matter what type of contract we're entering into, some of the things that we look at first we want to know who the parties are and what we're being identified in the contract as. Uh, you know, obviously, in, in our formal state contracts, many times we're identified as the state or the using agency uh, or by the, the department or agency name. Um, but in lease agreements and, and various other things, we, we may be identified differently. So that's the first thing that we're looking to identify. What role does, does your entity play in the agreement? Are we leasing space from somebody else? Are we the lessor? Are we contracting to, 
perform services for a third party, or are we trying to get a third party uh, to, to sign on to perform services for us? Is it a, a supply chain agreement? What are, we, what are we looking to do in that contract? And then whose contract is it? Whose template are we using? What are we starting with? Because that, that's something that helps us from a risk management perspective immensely. It's one thing to start with uh, a state template versus having to negotiate when we're looking at uh, a third-party template that, that's being utilized in those scenarios. So one of the biggest ones, obviously, from a negotiation standpoint is, has the contract already been executed? Because if it has, it's if we find exceptions that maybe the state can't agree to from an insurance standpoint, that can be much more difficult to, to navigate at that point. And then are there any special circumstances surrounding this particular uh, engagement? Are, are we underneath emergency procurement protocols? Is it a cooperative endeavor agreement with a, a local governmental entity? Um, are, we, are we looking to uh, least temporary space due to an emergency or a natural disaster. Um, and then always, as a risk management professional, the one question that we ask on any question that you bring to us is, what's the worst thing that can happen? And if, if any of you have talked to me before on the phone or in person, you know that my mind jumps to the, the really crazy examples of what may be going on in, in that particular scenario, or what's the worst exposure that I can think of. So. When we look at this, we, you can see risk management on this slide. We're, we're out here on the outside. The agency is typically the central point of, of any of these types of contracts, whether it's a procurement contract or a, a, we're leasing space from a third party to host a special event. It's still typically the agency that's driving that process. You have you know, your procurement department. You have legal counsel. You have the Office of Risk Management and your risk management professionals on your site, as well as, you know, you'll have finance and, and typically the department head that is giving authorization to go through this process. Understanding where we stand in this process for you is, is important because we're not here to mandate. We're here to provide uh, specific recommendations and try to position you in the best possible scenario from a risk standpoint. Ultimately, the goal here is that we're trying to ensure that the contract has two levels of protection. We want to ensure that the contractor is carrying appropriate insurance for the risk, and we also want to ensure that we have solid indemnification language contained within that agreement. It's important when looking at our contracts to understand how the risk flows as well. Uh, this is a a nice slide. I, I uh, was fortunate enough to be able to, to steal it from one of my colleagues. They <laughs> they told me it was okay to to take their uh, to take their slide. So I, I changed it up a little bit. But when we're looking at the liability food chain, that's that's something that changes based on what type of risk we're talking about. So if we're dealing with a construction contract, for example, uh, we're going to construct a new building. And we have, uh, you're going to have numerous subcontractors and sub subcontractors, uh, but ultimately the state is typically going to be in an agreement with the general contractor on that project. That's who we are turning to for answers. That's who we're enforcing contractual requirements against. From a general liability standpoint, their work product, what they're doing, and, and possible damages that are sustained due to their their accidents or negligence on site, that's typically going to flow downward. So we're the owner of the property. It happened on our property. We may be named in a suit, but we're going to turn to our general contractor who's actually there controlling the site and, and doing the work. They're going to turn to the subcontractor that they put the, that portion of the job out to, and in turn that subcontractor may have a sub-subcontractor that they're going to say, okay, you were the one that did the brass fittings on this plumbing, and that's what broke, and so it's your, it's your responsibility to make these people whole. Contrary to that, if we're dealing with a worksite injury, in many cases it flows the opposite direction. The sub-subcontractor may be a sole proprietor who doesn't carry work comp because they're not legally required to. Uh, 
Well, if they don't carry work comp, then that subcontractor needs to. If they don't have it, then the general contractor could ultimately be responsible for it, and that can flow all the way back up to the owner. Um, so that's what we're looking to, to address here is ensuring that we have the correct wording to protect ourselves from these various scenarios. There we go. So what is needed in a contract? Oh, wait, I went, I went too far here. Let me go back one, guys. Oh, what's needed in the contract? We need the types of coverages that we, that we actually want to require. We need to know what limits we want for those coverages. We want to ensure that they name us as an additional insured, and we'll talk more about that as we, as we go deeper into this presentation. And then, of course, as we talked about before, the indemnification language that, that's going to bind them to us contractually. Um, one of the things that, that I've mentioned to anybody that will listen is the insurance is simply the funding mechanism. The indemnification agreement, in many cases, is the driving force behind what they're responsible to us uh, for, what, what actions they have to protect us from. The reason that we want that insurance there is that it's a lot easier to enforce additional insured underneath uh, uh, an insurance contract than it is to have to go to court and argue that the indemnification uh, would be applicable. Uh, the, the duty to defend is much broader underneath an insuring agreement than it is underneath a contract. So what are the various required insurance coverages? When we look at required coverages, you'll see up top required in all contracts. We kind of look at that. That's the holy trinity. That's the one that, that we're going to say always needs to be there. Uh, workers' compensation and employers' liability, commercial general liability, and automobile liability. Outside of that, we look at what the contract is for to determine what other specialty coverages may need to be present. And uh, one of the big things that, that you'll see is a growing need for either professional liability or cyber liability, depending on what type of contract we're dealing with. Before I move on, just to, to point out a couple of them on this slide, uh, workers' compensation maritime is one that comes into play anytime we're dealing with work on or near water. Um, owner's protective liability is another one that doesn't come up often. Um, it typically would have to do more with construction or infrastructure projects where uh, there may be a question as to, to how traditional insurance applies. Okay. So workers' compensation, these next few slides are just to give a brief overview. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on most of these. Um, by all means, my contact information will be included in this, in this PowerPoint presentation. If you have specific questions about a particular coverage, I'm always available to, to talk about that. But workers' compensation is there to provide for the medical and wage benefits of the contractor's employees. We want to ensure that if there's a worksite accident, that those employees have a place to turn to um, and that they're not, that helps to dissuade from a lawsuit as well. As long as they're being taken care of and being brought back to, to be able to return to work, you tend to find that, that the lawsuits are dissuaded. Um, here in the state of Louisiana, employers are statutorily required to carry workers' compensation. In most cases, there are a couple of exceptions to that. Uh, when we deal with sole proprietors uh, or partnerships where the partners are also the only employees. So they, they all own the company and they don't have anybody else on the payroll. Uh, there are a few monopolistic states. What that means is that they have to, if you have, if we have a project that's going on in any one of these states, then they have to purchase that insurance coverage through their state's workers' comp fund. That's the only coverage that, that is uh, up to their regulatory standards. Like that's probably not the right way of saying it, but it means that that's the only one that they will deem as being um, in compliance. If you have workers' comp from another state and you go to do work in Ohio, Wyoming, Washington, or North Dakota, those states are going to require you to buy insurance coverage underneath their state funds. <clears throat> 
Uh, special workers' compensation issues, I kind of addressed this already. Corporate office, corporate officers, LLC members, partners and, and partnerships, and sole proprietors, uh, they're not required by law to have workers' compensation coverage on those members. Uh, on a certificate of insurance, there is a special box, and I'll show that to you when we get to that slide, um, that can exclude officers from the owners and officers from the, from the coverage. That's a question that we get from time to time as well. It's one that we do recommend at least contacting our office and having a discussion about how that would apply to the particular contract that we're dealing with. Um, indemnity, if no coverage, you'll find that in ORM's recommended wording, there is a section called workers' compensation indemnification. Um, I believe it's G, letter G, on, the, on our standard exhibit examples. But... Uh, Ultimately, that's to address those particular scenarios. If they're not required to carry workers' compensation, uh, the one that we run into probably the most is sole proprietorships um, for consulting contracts where they you know, have institutional knowledge because they were in the industry for a very long time. They decided to go into a consulting role um, and that it's just them. There's nobody. They don't have any employees. They don't have anybody working for them. Uh, those types of individuals are almost never going to carry workers' compensation because it's cost prohibitive. They would have to factor in the entire uh, assets of the company as what they're protecting against. So there is, there is, there are some examples where workers' compensation may be is not appropriate. But we want to have that language in there that protects us from that individual being able to bring. Uh, a workers' compensation suit against the state as a statutory employer. Okay. Uh, commercial general liability, this is your coverage for the actual ongoing operations and completed works of the contractor. Uh, it provides on and off-premises operations coverage. Uh, there's, there's language in these policies that, coverage is, that covers liability assumed in contracts that would fall to your indemnification type agreements that are within there. Uh, almost all CGL policies now provide for personal and advertising uh, liability as well, personal injury and advertising liability. This is things like libel and slander, the written, uh, if you're dealing with a, a media company who's going to, to be putting together marketing plans for you, that's a very important coverage. Um, like I said, typically this is going to be simply included in your commercial general liability, uh, but it, it is one that our language suggests that it's necessary. One of the things to be aware of for, for anyone that's going into uh, an agreement with a, a third party is that all CGL policies have some pretty standard exclusions. That's one that you that you are going to see no matter who the carrier is, who the company is, Things like intentional acts are never going to be covered by insurance um, underneath a, com a standard commercial general liability policy. That is, uh, that is something that we would turn back to the contractual obligation for indemnification. All right. Uh, automobile liability, to, to kind of complete that, that first three required coverages, this is coverage for the use and operation of an automobile. Um, we typically would require or we would desire for them to provide uh, any auto liability coverage. So that would be one that when you look at automobile designation symbols, that would be number one, would provide coverage for any auto. So if their employee gets into a vehicle, that policy automatically provides automobile liability coverage for, for their operation of that vehicle. A lot of carriers won't write that anymore. Uh, so You'll see that we ask for owned, hired, and non-owned, which on an on a automobile policy would be identified as number two, number eight, and number nine. And that would provide coverage for almost any automobile that those employees operate. Um, there's some small gaps in that, in that combination of designations, but it's about as close as you can get to any auto as there is. There are obviously examples of when automobile liability may not really be necessary, and, and one of those scenarios would be lessees. If we have you know, a third party that's leasing office space and they're not providing livery or delivery services or 
loading and unloading trucks. It's simply a, a standard corporate office space where employees are going to drive their personal automobiles and park in a parking lot. Then automobile liability really probably isn't necessary for an agreement like that. Okay. Oh, I forgot. We still I, I kept one of my clip parts here for you guys. Okay. Uh, professional liability. This is one that's been growing in, in necessity probably for really the past 15 to 20 years, but uh, I've, I've seen a drastic uptick in its applicability even in the past five years. Uh, but this is coverage that would provide for the errors and omissions of designated professions. Accountants, architects, engineers, medical professionals, attorneys, hazard experts, uh, information technology, which in many cases may be also encompassed in a cyber liability policy, um, but there are standalone policies relative to information technology as well. Uh, contracts for a broker of record for insurance, uh, like, like we're talking about here. All of those types of professions would, would be applicable to a, an errors and omissions policy. And that's one that when we're dealing with consulting contracts is a question that needs to be asked. No matter what the consulting is for, uh, ultimately, it's one that at least needs to be looked at as to whether or not it should be included in the insurance requirements. Uh, bonds, uh, obviously there's statutory requirements for bonds on various contracts. Um, Louisiana Revised Statute 3822-41, requires a surety bond for public construction contracts over 25,000. Uh, but there are, there are other avenues or other, other areas where a bond may be a solution to a problem, uh, whether we're talking about a, a surety fidelity or performance bond. These are agreements that can be triggered based on specific uh, language. The bond insurer is agreeing to provide a certain level of coverage for whatever the trigger may be. So if it's an issue of performance where they have a time frame to complete a project, the performance bond can be triggered if they don't meet that so that the agency would have the funds necessary to bring in another contractor or the bond uh, issuer would bring in the contractor for you. So when we look at these are very common on construction projects, we're seeing them in some specialty types of uh, scenarios as well where possibly there's not an easy insurance solution to them that a bond may also be a, a, a suitable alternative or consideration. Uh, pollution liability is, is certainly applicable to uh, many types of construction projects. If we're doing work on, uh, on or near water, it can certainly be if we're dealing with underground storage tanks or if we know that we're, we're dealing with hazardous materials or uh, abatement scenarios, pollution liability is certainly going to be applicable. Um, this can be issued either on a project-specific basis or blanket coverage. If we're talking about a construction project, then perhaps project-specific where it identifies a certain coverage limit for your project is going to be the, the uh, most suitable. But if we're dealing with a larger scenario like in a, an emergency remediation contract where the work could be statewide, blanket pollution liability could be a, a good alternative to ensure that there's some coverage there for those types of things. The reason that pollution liability coverage is important is because commercial general liability policies, automobile liability policies, even uh, wet marine vessel type liability policies don't cover pollution specifically. They actually take that away and they'll give you a, a small little give back. Uh, so if, if your forklift leaks oil, then your commercial general liability policy would actually provide some, some coverage to clean up that, uh, that oil that leaked out. If you have a, an underground storage tank and that leaks, commercial liability is not going to give you anything for that, and that's where the pollution liability comes into play. Uh, wet marine covers the operation of, of wet marine vessels. There's hull uh, and protection and indemnity coverage. If you are dealing with a, a contract on water, we have some sample language, I believe, in our um, insurance manual. But by all means, reach out to, to our offices, and we're happy to provide some, some language to be able to include in your contracts where uh, work is being performed on or near water. <clears throat> 
aviation is the same way. Uh, if we're dealing with uh, with crop dusting or um, aerial surveying, um, now we also have to, to consider aviation insurance based on uh, operation and use of, of drones for, for various things. Uh, that is something that could fall, drone operation could fall either under aviation or under general liability policy with a, with a drone endorsement uh, based on the size of the drone. Uh, the FAA has some, still has some pretty strict regulations as to what would classify a drone as requiring true, a true aviation liability policy as opposed to being able to be on a, an endorsement on a CGL policy. For the most part, what you're going to run into is drones that would fall underneath that FAA regulation, but it is one for consideration as well. So cyber liability. Um, this is probably the one that's getting the most run right now. Uh, everybody is aware of, of cyber liability now, which 10 years ago wasn't the case. Uh, people didn't know when you said a cyber liability policy, what that was. What I will tell you is the name cyber liability is kind of a misnomer. Uh, when we talk cyber liability, what you're actually talking about is data breach liability as well as, in most cases, uh, cybersecurity liability. It is a combination type of coverage. So it provides both, both first-party coverage and third-party liability coverage underneath the same umbrella. Um, there are various coverage lines underneath a cyber liability policy, uh, but what we find or what, what you'll see out there, the, the most triggered aspects are those first-party breach response services, uh, and, and that's what we're looking for in, in many cases when we're contracting with a vendor where this becomes applicable. Either we're looking for them to have the technology E&O piece, the professional liability, because they're performing uh, professional level technology services for us, or if they're housing data for us, then we also want the first party breach response. So if they are actually uh, housing the, the state's data, that's an aspect that comes into play, is if they're breached on their end, we need to know that they can respond to those, to those regulatory uh, compliance issues, to notification requirements and various things like that. Oh. Before I move on from that one, actually, um, the, the reason that I say it's a misnomer as well is that it is not just for a technology breach. Cyber liability policies will also respond to inadvertent releases of actual hard files. Um, one of the, there is a very large I'm using air quotes as I say this, cyber liability breach um, that occurred from, I believe it was at a law firm, but don't quote me on that. It's been a while since I looked at, at that example, uh, but I, they were moving offices. So they had packed up all of their client files from the past 20 years, put them into a box truck, were moving them across town in, in the back of this box truck, going down the interstate, the box truck gets, gets bumped, the back door flies open, and dumps all of these files all over the interstate. Of course, as we all know, when you see a piece of paper on the interstate, it doesn't just stay in one place. They start blowing around, so they had a huge notification requirement uh, because they dumped 20 years of files all over the interstate and had to notify all these individuals. Had nothing to do with a, a cyber-related breach, but the policies would respond to those types of releases of information as well. So. There's two aspects to it. Obviously, what we see nowadays as we continue to strive for a paperless society and move that route is that uh, we are we're moving more away from the issue of a paper breach and, and going more towards the aspect of the cyber aspect is being the concern. So uh, recommended minimum insurance limits. When you start going through this, and, and usually I get, I get y'all all involved, but since y'all can't talk back to me, it's not going to be as funny. But we look at uh, workers' compensation. We have a required minimum insurance that we would suggest on any contract. And the reason that we, rec that we recommend these limits is because uh, almost in, in most scenarios, they're up to industry standards as far as being 
available to those to those individuals to go out and procure this this amount of coverage. Uh, so when we look at workers' compensation, the employer's liability aspect is where you'll find the the actual dollar limit. We request one million dollars as the recommended minimum limit, depending on the type of contract. What we're what we're requiring, obviously, this is the lowest we recommend. You can always ask for more insurance on any one of these, but you'll start to see a trend here for our recommended minimums. Commercial general liability, we recommend one million per occurrence, two million dollars in the aggregate. What that means is, for any one incident. They would the, the insurer would pay up to one million dollars. The aggregate limit is what they will pay in total for all claims during the during that policy year. One of the main reasons that you look for a, a higher aggregate limit than the occurrence limit is not for the one really bad claim. It's so that we're not eating away at our per occurrence limit uh, on these types of uh, on the contractor's insurance policy. We don't want them to have a $1 million policy, but they've had three claims throughout the year, all amounting to $100,000. And then when the million dollar claim comes on our contract, they only have $700,000 worth of coverage. Um, it, it's a lot easier to turn to an insurer to get them to pay a claim than it is to have to go to a contractor to enforce their indemnity obligations and tell them they've got to come out their own pocket. So that, that's, that's the difference between the occurrence and the aggregate. The occurrence is, any one, any one incident, what they will pay, the aggregate is what they will pay in total for the year among all claims, no matter how many. Uh, automobile liability, one million per occurrence. Professional liability, one million per claim. Uh, the, the per claim there is, is something that you'll see on professional liability, in many cases cyber liability as well. Um, we. We are seeing it growing with some of these more comprehensive liability packages that, that some uh, entities are trying to procure. In place of placing a bunch of different policies, they place a package policy with one insurer where it covers general liability, professional liability, automobile liability, all underneath one blanket policy. Um, that becomes an issue sometimes because once they lump professional liability in there, it may trigger that the entire policy is per claim. When you see per claim, what that means is that policy is a is uh, underwritten on a claims made basis as opposed to an occurrence basis. And we'll talk a little bit about the difference there because you'll see in our recommended wording that that comes up. Um, the surety, fidelity, performance bonds, that's gonna be based on the contract value and, and really driven by that. Pollution liability, once again, a million dollars as a minimum. And those are just because ultimately that's what we see. For the most part, when you go out and, and, and purchase an insurance policy, whether I'm a daycare operator or a general contractor, uh, for the most part, you're gonna go buy a million dollars in, in the minimum. There are scenarios where you may run into people that carry lower than the limit that we request. Um, obviously those can be reviewed on an individual basis. But you can see the trend there. You know, that's kind of our cutoff is the million dollar base limit on all of these insurance coverages. So uh, continuing to look at that, in our, in our manual, you'll find that we actually have sample exhibits. Um, they'll go through kind of the basic insurances that we recommend for, for these types of contracts. It will not include things like specialty uh, coverages like wet marine or, or aviation, but it gives you a good base level of, of what we would like to see in every contract. Um, the different exhibits are, are based on what types of contracts they are. So you can see those examples here. So when we start looking at what does that language look like, um, this is simply a, a, an excerpt from one of our exhibits one of the things that I just want to point out here is that when you look at commercial general liability or automobile liability, we identify specific ISO forms, insurance service office forms, which are standardized forms that many insurers utilize for their policy forms. Um, every now and then you'll run into a contractor that throws up their hands about including that language, but 
what you'll see there in red on these on both of those uh, paragraphs is that we allow for equivalence to be used. The reason that we allow for equivalence is because there are quite a few insurers that have get gone to manuscript forms. So for the most part, they're heavily based off of a, a standardized and ISO form, but they've made various changes to suit their risk appetite. And um, that's what we're going to look at here is that when we turn this over and the, <clears throat> excuse me, the contractor sees what the insurance requirements are, hopefully they're bringing that to their insurer or their insurance broker and providing them what the insurance requirements are for the contract and they're seeing what forms are required for those various policies. If they're utilizing a manuscript form, we want that form to be at least equivalent to the coverage that would have been provided underneath the insurance service office form, that standardized form. When we talk about the what the additional requirements are on those coverages, that first paragraph here is what identifies um, the additional insured requirement, once again, we request um, specific ISO forms for additional insured status. You'll see the CG 2010 and the CG 2037 because we're requesting to be additional insured for both their ongoing work and for their completed work. So even after the job's done, if a lawsuit were to come in based on the work that they completed for us, the completed project, we still want to be able to turn to their insurer as an additional insured for defense um, of that claim. Okay. Um, under paragraph B, and I know this is one that, that probably most of you on here have had to deal with at some point, going to verify an insurer's AM best rating, which is a lot of fun. Um, the link down there at the bottom here in blue is a link to the AM best website where you would go to, to – be able to look up an insurer's rating. One of the things that you run into quite a bit on, on insurance ratings, especially now I find even more so than, than in years past, is that the insurer specifically listed on the certificate of insurance is uh, underneath a parent company of, say, an, an entity like a Lloyd's of London who has so many different insurer uh, syndicates underneath them, and we have to look up and find the, the parent company to be able to get an A and best rating. That is something that is acceptable. We're looking to utilize, if they're not rated individually, if they're underneath a, a parent company, that's, that's the AM best rating that we'd be turning to. So um, our Exhibit D is related specifically to uh, insurance requirements for new constructions, additions, and large renovations. This is your, your contractor, uh, your general contractor requirements that we'd be looking at. One of the big differences between what we see in your standard Exhibit A, which is our, our recommendations for insurance requirements for contractors, is that we're going to include builder's risk here. Um, builder's risk is a, is a first-party coverage that essentially is providing protection for that project. They will underwrite the full value of the, uh, of the construction project to provide coverage to ensure that if there's a loss part of the way through, there's insurance there to make sure that that contractor has the funds available to be able to pick up the work and, and continue on. Um, underneath B and D, there are some additional aspects or additional requirements that we look at. Um, obviously, flood coverage is, is a big one here in Louisiana, really anywhere in the state, uh, but certainly when we look down in South Louisiana, uh, the, the threat of flood is, is always prevalent. Uh, we we include that that part B here underneath the builder's risk because your standard standard builder's risk policy, without an endorsement for flood, typically does not cover flood damage to the project. Um, so we want to ensure that that requirement is there as well. Uh, if you're dealing with a specialty contractor, someone like a, an HVAC uh, professional that's coming in simply to install uh, a new HVAC system, they don't necessarily need to to carry builder's risk, they can provide an installation floater in, in lieu of a builder's risk policy so that that equipment is covered until it's been installed onto your, onto your building. Okay, so we talked a little bit about additional insurance already. This is just recapping that. 
Um, we look to, to name the agency, the office, its officers, agents, employees, and volunteers. You want everybody identified as being an additional insured. Looking for both the CG 2010 and the CG 2037 to ensure that we're covered for both their ongoing operations and their completed operations. Um, and then just to, to look for the wording to be identified on the certificate. This is an example of what that additional insured ISO form is. Uh, this is the ISO 2010. So it, it actually shows you what it does to the, the policy. This is what we're asking for. When we say we want the state to be named as an additional insured on the CG 2010 ISO form, it's gonna change the definition of who is an insured. And it's going to, to name us as it is amended to include as an additional insurer, the person or organization shown in the schedule. And there's a, there's a schedule above this that would appear on that form identifying your agency. And it's going to provide that we are now an insured underneath their policy for the contractor's acts and omissions and the acts and omissions of, the, of those acting on behalf of the contractor in the performance of their ongoing work. So if, they're, if we get named in a lawsuit because of the contractor's work, that insurer will provide a defense for the state. So we're now, it's working in conjunction with that indemnification language that we've also got in the contract itself, but by requiring this underneath the, the insurance policy, it's putting an obligation on the contractor's insurer as well uh, to make sure that we have the protections moving forward. Okay. Uh, waivers of subrogation, they're the only area that we recommend requiring it is in relation to workers' compensation. Um, as a rule, the Office of Risk Management does not provide a waiver of subrogation in favor of a third party, but we do ask for it from the third parties on workers' compensation alone. Um, so subrogation is the right uh, of the insurer to come back against uh, another party if it's deemed that the other party contributed to the loss. Uh, so the reason that we request an own workers' compensation is simply that if they're going to have employees on our site, we would like to uh, their workers' comp their workers' comp carrier to acknowledge that they are on our site. If they're injured on our site, they're not going to turn back to the state and say, "Well, you know, your employee was walking down the hall and was carrying a box, and our employee tried to jump out of the way and, and hurt themselves." They're going to look to it as they have a statutory obligation underneath the workers' compensate, com compensation laws to provide that benefit to them. They're not going to turn and try to subrogate back against the state and, and place um, negligence on the state to recover the benefits that they paid out. We, uh, the Office of Risk Management, does not waive rights of subrogation on, on contracts um, except for workers' compensation. So we won't do it for general liability. We don't do it for auto liability. And really that's mainly due to statutory restrictions. We're dealing with you know, the self-insurance fund. Uh, it would kind of go against statute uh, to, to allow or to waive our rights of subrogation to recover funds that were uh, due to the negligence of a third party. Okay. So then we get into what is an a certificate of insurance. A certificate of insurance is just a snapshot in time. It's a picture of what that contractor's coverage is on the day that they generate that certificate. Uh, if you have a multi-year contract, it's very important to, to get updated certificates based on either the contract renewal or if we're tracking the expiration dates on those various policies that they're carrying, Anytime a policy expires, we should be requesting a new certificate of insurance showing the updated coverage. Um, it doesn't actually convey any rights that aren't granted in the policy itself. So that's why those endorsements that we request for additional insured status are so important. If uh, we're, we're, we're asking for specific, uh, a specific agreement from their insurer with those form numbers. We, uh, ORM requires that you maintain certificates for at least five years or the applicable prescriptive period. The reason for that is if you have a certificate that's naming you as an additional insured, 
and a suit is brought after the completion of the, the project, you want to make sure that you still have that proof that you were on that pot or that you were named as additional insured until a suit can't be brought against you. Um, one of the things that or one of the pieces that it's that we recommend in our language is that payment accept, acceptance of completed work or failure of the agency to require proof of compliance or acceptance of a non-compliance certificate does not release the contractor from the insurance or indemnification requirements stated within this this contract. So ultimately, even if we make a mistake, that language is there to, to hold the contractor to what they were required to do underneath this section. Okay. So just looking at a certificate of insurance. One of the biggest ones is making sure that the insured's name is correct. Um, the insured's name should match the name of the entity you're contracting with. There are some exceptions to that, or, or, but typically they require a little more work on, on our part. Um, and if you're dealing with a subsidiary of a large, uh, a large corporation, they may be an insured underneath the large corporation's insurance policy, but we need verification of that. Um, usually it's also done on the certificate of insurance as a second page to it, which will identify the subsidiaries that are insured on the policy. And you're, the entity that you're contracting with should at least appear on that list. We need to verify that all the coverages and limits are as requested, check the AM best rating on the insurance companies, confirm the agency's additional insured status, and your name should also be listed as the certificate holder. So. And looking at what that looks like up here, you'll see at the top of the page, and I don't know if y'all can see my mouse, but we're looking, for, we're looking for starting at the top, we need to see the name of the insured. On this one, we've got Rich Contractor, and it's got his address right there. Above that is the name of the producer. That's who places that insured's coverage and is a contact that you can utilize to verify uh, any questions that you have about the certificate as well. Next to that producer box, you'll see contact name. That is going to be the broker. And in many cases, it's the, the actual broker that placed that coverage for that contractor. So it's a, it's a in a lot of cases, a direct line to them. Uh, underneath the broker's information, you'll see the, the insurers are actually listed out. Um, there should be an NAIC number, a National Association of Insurance Commissioners number, that will help us to look up their AM best ratings. That's not always filled out, but you can request them to, to fill that information out if you choose, uh, if they leave it blank. Then we get down into the actual coverages. So almost always what you'll see here is commercial general liability is gonna be first, automobile liability will be second. There's a box that may be blank, but on this particular example, you'll see it listed as B here where it identifies that this particular contractor carries an umbrella liability policy that sits on top of their other coverages. Um, if it's blank, that means that they're simply not carrying that. It's not anything that's missing unless we specifically required it. Workers' compensation will be after that. And then uh, more often than not, there will be a blank box underneath it. But if we are requiring additional coverages like professional liability, cyber liability, or uh, a wet marine or aviation policy, that'll appear here. Uh, the policy effective dates should fall within our contract period. So we want that policy to be effective before the date that they're gonna begin work. And ideally, if it's less than a year contract, then the policy expiration date will fall after the anticipated completion date of the work to be performed. Uh, lots of times, like we said, if we're dealing with a say a consulting contract that's gonna span a year or more, um, we're going to be dealing with the need to get updated certificates when that policy expiration date comes around. So it's something good that maybe we note that in the file on, our, on, our, on that contract file that at this date, we need to go ahead and request a new certificate. Uh, down here in the description of operations, lots of times this is where you'll see language specific to your additional insured status. Uh, there's also some areas where that can be checked off, but we're seeing more and more that, that it'll be specifically written in here. And then, of course, your name should appear at the bottom in the certificate holder box. 
that's where you're going. You need to give them your name and how you want it to appear as a certificate holder, including your address. Um, and then, of course, that certificate needs to be signed. And it's going to be signed typically by the insurance broker. That's who's authorized to bind coverage on behalf of the insurer. So they're identifying and tying them to this certificate that they generated. Um, look, and this is just giving you a, a closer view of those things. As you can see, signed by the broker over here, that, that's important. We do, from time to time, you will receive a certificate that's signed by no one. Send it back to them, tell them it needs to be signed. Okay. Uh, once again, this is just another example of additional insured endorsements. Um, they will, and one of the things that I wanted to point out here, the reason that we list in the insurance language that these are the minimum limits required is that we are looking at that to try not to sublimit the coverage that's provided to the state. Um, additional insured endorsements will sublimit the amount of coverage available based on the contractual requirements. So. If you know you want to have higher limits, then you definitely want to put higher limits as the requirement. Uh, this just gives you an idea of some of the various things that are on the insurance uh, certificate checklist. There is a checklist actually in our uh, contracts manual that you can print out and have on your desk. If you need help finding that, feel free to reach out to me. It's, simply a guide to help you go down and make sure that you've, you've got everything that you're looking for here. Uh, one of the big ones that we're seeing come up more and more is bullet point number three here where it says occurrence rather than claims made box is marked. Uh, I'd mentioned that as we see more comprehensive liability documents, coverage documents being put together, we're starting to see commercial general liability being provided on a claims made basis, which means that the policy has to be in, for, in force when the claim is brought, not when the actual incident happened. So that presents an issue, especially on completed projects that, a, you know, a contractor just drops their coverage after they complete a project with you. If they don't get uh, an extended reporting period or, or tail coverage, then that could be a, an issue moving forward. If you come up across something like this, then by all means reach out to us and we can review the issue and, and see if it's something that could be acceptable. Okay, so uh, this is just a continuation of that as well. When we look at what additional forms we might want to see with that, our language requests that they provide the endorsements along with the certificate. Uh, we see that I think it's probably about 50-50. You know, by all means, if they've agreed to it and haven't haven't asked for an exception to that requirement, you can go back to them and tell them that they need to get their broker to submit the additional insured forms to go along with it. Okay. So uh, when we look at certificates of insurance, if we have, if we don't have a certificate and we don't have a contract, then we really got, we really have nothing at that point. If we've got the certificate of insurance, but we don't have a contract with any requirements, then we've got a piece of paper with our name on it. Um, many cases, you'll have a certificate and, and the additional insured portion of it will say, will actually be written as required by written contract. Uh, you know, the certificate holder is additional insured. If you don't have a written contract, that's, the broker's way of making sure that they're not obligating their insured to anything that they didn't agree to. Uh, so that's that's important. But our goal here is that we've got the certificate of insurance, we've got the contract with the appropriate wording, and we're an additional insured underneath the contractor's policy with the insured contract provisions. So looking at the A and best ratings, uh, obviously this is just a slide to, to kind of identify how those ratings um, would apply, you're gonna have two, uh, two aspects to the rating, the financial strength rating, which will be on an A to S level. Um, and then you've got the financial size category, uh, one through 15. So when we start to try to identify questionable insurance, uh, obviously if the insurance, the limits of insurance provided on the certificate 
don't meet the contractual requirements, that's a red flag. If there's no additional insured endorsement uh, identified on the certificates, the, the company's AM rating, AM best rating, is below the insurance requirements. The reason that that's an issue has to do with solvency and whether or not that insurer will, will be able to meet their financial obligations. Uh, risk retention groups, which are kind of growing right now, especially with some of these specialized risks. If they're AM best rating, then it's not an issue at all, but many of them aren't. Um, it, and so it gets into that same aspect of are they able to meet their financial obligations. Self-insurance funds, except for workers' compensation. Um, Self-insurance funds are difficult because in many cases they are not uh, identified in a true sense as a self-insurance fund. Workers' compensation is pretty heavily regulated, uh, so if we're dealing with a private entity that self-insures for workers' compensation, they can provide verification of that, that it is actuarially sound and been reviewed by that state's Department of Insurance. Um, if we're dealing with it on other things, many times if I, if I have a, an individual come to me and say, well, we're self-insured for cyber liability. They're not truly self-insured. They've just decided to retain that risk underneath their actual, uh, as a risk that they're gonna pay out underneath their own funds. The reason that that can present an issue when we start talking about self-insurance is do they have a coverage form that's dictating how coverage would apply? Um, it's it's certainly a tricky one to deal with, but we are running into it a little more now than I think we have in the past. Claims made coverage, we talked about the issue there. Um, there are some exceptions, especially when we talk about professional liability, because that's how it's written. So professional liability, medical malpractice, things like that will be written on a claims made base, basis. Okay. Um, so just as we start to, to dive into the tail end of this, we talked a lot at the beginning about indemnification uh, language that's going to be included. I know uh, OSP and, and the Office of General Counsel has been moving to create uh, a separation of the duty to defend and the indemnification obligations within our contracts. Uh, and just to kind of give everybody an oversight of, of what the difference here is. Um, Defense and indemnity clauses are routine devices used in contracts to shift responsibility for potential risks. Um, the terms defend and indemnify are often utilized together, but there are some distinct differences. And, and this is the reason that I like to point this out is because when we're looking at that language from a legal perspective as compared to insurance coverages, the indemnification language within the contract itself is designed to, contra to, to create that contractual agreement, that contractual obligation to indemnify us. The insurance, as I mentioned before, is there to provide a funding source. By ensuring that we are additionally insured as well and named that way on the contractor's insurance, it broadens the duty to defend, uh, and, and that's because now the, the insurer has agreed to indemnify us for the contractor's actions as well. So when we bring that, that or when we tender that claim over to the contractor, if we're additional insured underneath their insurance policy, then their insurer is obligated to respond as well on our behalf. Just kind of jumping a little further, and this is kind of what I identified there. The insurer's duty to defend is broader than its duty to indemnify. And that's what, in many cases, you're looking for more than anything else, is that response and defense of a claim until it's determined who was actually at fault. You know, and that's something that we're looking at, is that a duty to defend is typically triggered any time a potentially covered claim or suit is brought. So the insurer has to respond more quickly than the contractor would. Um, so in that language, these are the, the three main keys that we're looking for as well. Uh, we, want the, we want them to indemnify or directly reimburse us for payments made. We want them to defend us uh, to ensure that there's legal defense for, for any claims that are brought and hold us harmless or pay losses on our behalf. That's ultimately what we'd like to have happen is that they accept the claim, they defend it, and they pay out any, any legitimate claims on our behalf. Uh, this is a, a simple example of that language here. Um, 
obviously OSP has language available in their uh, in their boilerplate language as well. It's very good. I recommend using it. Uh, but ultimately, the the one thing that I like to point out here, and, and anytime you're entering into agreement, whether this is through a procurement process, whether it's outside of it, it's a, a CEA with a, another public body, both parties can agree to share responsibility when both contribute to a loss. But what we try to ensure is that the state does not try to take on the liability of a third party. So that's what you want to be very aware of, that there are some statutory restrictions around that. Uh, the state cannot assume another party's negligence except in some very limited scenarios. Um, so this is when we start looking at our sample language that was in our old exhibits. Uh, now that has been enhanced quite a bit if you're going through, uh, through OSP and that contracting process. It's going to be in your boilerplate language already. We do have some language that's available in our sample exhibits, but if you're going through the uh, through the uh, the OSP process or are utilizing that language, you would just simply remove that language from the exhibit on the tail end. Some red flags: if you if you're looking at an indemnification agreement, and I'm really going to point to to one here in the bottom paragraph. Um, and you'll see it in red. It says, companies shall have the authority to provide the defense counsel of their choice at agency's sole cost and expense. So ultimately what I'm looking at here is if we're entering into an agreement where the state is going to provide some level of indemnification. Not really going to be in our procurements for the most part, um, but every now and then we, we run into some odd situations. The reason that, that I bring this language up is because I'm seeing it more and more uh, as of late where they try to slip that in that the company that's asking for indemnification doesn't have the right to choose their own counsel at, at the expense of the indemnitor. They can bring in their own counsel, but then they, can, they have to pay for it. We're going to provide, if we're going to control, if they're going to come seeking indemnification, then we want to ensure that we have control of that defense. That's the same courtesy that we give to the contractor in the existing language that's out there today. Uh, in general, with your indemnification agreement, you want to make sure that someone's responsible for damages. If we're all indemnifying each other, it can create a very gray situation, and the courts are going to interpret how that works. Um, ultimately, here in Louisiana, you can't contract away your negligence. Uh, the person who is legally responsible for the damage should also be the person who's factually responsible for the damages. There are some, some scenarios where there's a little more leeway on that, but uh, we don't want our indemnifications to be overly broad. Uh, we don't want to try to, to contract away our own negligence. Uh, so looking at force majeure, and, and this is kind of simply some bonus uh, information here, we're seeing these things pop up, and I get questions sometimes about force majeure language. Um, ultimately, this is a little bit broader than the risk management aspect, but we have started seeing, and just to kind of bring it to everyone's attention, where they're trying to specifically identify things like pandemic as a force majeure. They want it written into the contract to ensure that an event like a COVID-19 doesn't, uh, would qualify and allow them to, to miss deadlines or get out of contract completely, that it would be a force majeure. That's something that you know you really need to look at uh, very thoroughly, and depending on the type of contract, it can have an impact. Uh, especially if we're dealing with emergency response services and things like that, having adequate continuation of operation plans and contingency plans for natural disasters, pandemics, and and even shortage shortages of manpower could be essential to that contract to ensure that it, it's available to carry it out. Um, finally, limitation of liability clauses. Uh, this is one that I think is expanding quite a bit, and it's simply one to be careful with. Um, I, if you're going through OSP then, and you're utilizing their language, great. They also will be reviewing any changes that the, the contractor requests. 
and so we're we're in good standing there, but um, we're seeing it quite a bit on uh, technology type contracts, things in relation to the cyber domain. Uh, in in some cases, they're trying to limit their liability to an insurance policy, as you can see from the language down here in uh, in red in the middle of the paragraph. In the case of a claim related to a data breach, the contractor's liability will be limited to coverage requirements set forth and whatever they're they're required to carry. That's something that to be aware of and, and simply be looking for. Uh, so. Going through just common errors that we see many times is not reviewing the certificates or getting an incomplete uh, or having incomplete insurance requirements where we simply don't use everything. Um, I know under the LISA system, as we discussed, the, uh, the risk of accidentally utilizing older or outdated language uh, should be less likely or eliminated completely. Um, if there's no insurance requirements for the bid or no indemnification language, uh, this is a big one. And in a lot of cases, we'll, we'll find that insurance company A and best ratings are, aren't included or are not verifiable or not enforcing insurance requirements at all. Um, within our manual itself, there are explanations on some of the things that we discussed today. There are definitions of occurrence versus claims made policies. Um, you can see coverage definitions and examples of what the various coverages do, and there's some indemnification agreement explanations as well. I'm going to wrap it up here because I know I'm a little bit over already. If we have any questions before we go, we got some questions. Okay. Is flood insurance not included in a builder's risk policy? How would we be able to determine if flood insurance is or isn't included? So on a builder's risk, on the certificate for the builder's risk, it should identify um, that they're providing flood coverage. They they should actually specifically identify the flood coverage there if they're if they're endorsing the builder's risk policy to provide the flood. They could also provide flood coverage through a separate policy. So it'll go one of two ways: either the builder's risk should identify that they have the flood coverage. If it doesn't then we have to go back to the contractor to verify that, hey, they need to identify that flood has been endorsed for the builder's risk coverage, or they need to provide a certificate for the separate flood policy that's covering the project. Okay, next question is, what is the recommended level of coverage for chartered aircraft? Chartered aircraft, well, that would go to that 1 million being the, the minimum limit uh, on aviation liability. Um, I would certainly take a look at what are we chartering it for, um, how many if we're how many passengers we're going to have. Um, there may be a separation of your blanket liability coverage and wanting to include language specific to passenger liability, which is uh, basically what they would owe to each passenger injured on the aircraft. Um, and we can certainly provide you some samples of that, but ultimately it, we'd start with that $1 million limit and then go up from there based on the risk that we're looking at. So if you're, if you're dealing with a highly hazardous situation or if we know we're chartering a, a commercial airline that's gonna be transporting you know, 150 passengers on behalf of us, then we may certainly want to increase the limit from $1 million there because we, we know that we have a higher exposure. Okay, the next question is, does the contractor's address have to be a physical address? No, it does not have to be a physical address. Um, you can request it to be a physical address, but typically the, uh, it, it actually, I would say it's in more cases than not, it will probably be the post office box for a lot of these larger entities because that's the mailing address that the insurance broker will have on file. Um, if there is a question or an issue with uh, a contractor's address, that's certainly something that we would encourage you to reach out to us about. Um, the key there, though, is that the name matches. Um, the physical address could come into play only if we're dealing with specific site coverage. So if you're, if you're worried about um, they're going to set up a remote site 
in the state of Louisiana and they're out of, they're an out of state entity um, and you want that that certificate to specifically identify and identify coverages provided for that site in the state of Louisiana more often than not that actually won't be provided in the insured box where up at the top of the certificate it would be provided on a second page to the uh, a court form certificate of insurance identifying the various sites where insurance uh, coverage is applicable okay the next question is does the requirement for the state of Louisiana to be listed as an additional insured apply to automobile liability coverage uh, we do request it so here's a, a quick one in a commercial auto liability policy um, who is an insured the the actual definition of who is an insured will include those who you are performing work with underneath a contract so it's actually in most cases automatic uh, well as long as they're if they're utilizing that um, that ISO form CA0001 uh, as we identify that's how that language reads so the minute that they're performing or they're in the course and scope of the contract performing work underneath that contract for us we are additional insured underneath their policy whether they've identified it or not um, but typically we want to see that that check mark appears on the certificate of insurance as well okay we have one last question if the office of state procurement bids an agency term contract for an agency should the certificate holder be state procurement or should it be the agency so this is a I would typically and have I guess I'd, I'd need more information about when we say agency term contract I would assume that we're that they're only performing work for that agency and if that's the case then typically the agency should be the one that's named as additional insured um, the language that I typically would recommend is actually making it the state of Louisiana comma Department of or Office of whoever the agency is and then their uh, agents employees volunteers all of that language would appear if it's a an OSP controlled contract that like a, a statewide contract then OSP is obviously going to be the named insured we're still going to try to from our office we'll still look to enforce that additional insured obligation uh, across the board there as well but that's where the state of Louisiana being the blanket that we're all under and then the agency name to identify who is the the actual using agency on it to give it some specificity that's all the questions that we have all right well this last slide that's up there has my contact information uh, once again that's a link to the to the contract manual um, by all means feel free to follow up with me and my understanding is that this will be posted for y'all to review um, usually I, I I try to draw a little more interaction out of the crowd but I know it's not that kind of setting so hopefully uh, there was some valuable information for you and feel free to reach out to me with any follow-up questions